in this video, we're going to talk about how empaths, if you're an empath, how do you destroy relationships? And I'm not talking about bad relationships. I'm talking about how empaths destroy great and good relationships. So, and, and maybe you found like in your past, maybe in your past, you've been in great relationship, great relationships or a good relationship, and you feel you're the one that destroyed it. You're the one that kind of ruined that relationship. So, so of course, I am an empath. That's why I know so much about empaths because I'm one. And, you know, let's do a short introduction. Okay. If you're really new to this, you're really new to, you think you're an empath, really an empaths have two superpowers. Okay. And our superpower is we are very, very sensitive to other people's energy. Okay. We can really pick up other people's energy. And, you know, for example, like, and the basics of it, if, if someone's sad, we can really feel that somebody's sad. We can pick up that energy. If someone's angry, we can pick up that energy. A lot of times, we absorb that energy. Not a lot of times, but all the time. We absorb other people's energy. And the reason why we've learned this, and we've learned this as a kid, you know, usually as a child, usually as an empath, usually we grew up in, in, in a very domineering environment, maybe by both parents. Maybe it could have been one parent that was very domineering. Maybe it's a one parent that was very, very, very strict with you. Um, and, or maybe they were angry being around, they screamed at you a lot. And then it can, I mean, it can actually go worse from there, of course, but even in that environment, what, what's happened as a kid, I mean, as, as far back as we can remember, you know, it's the kind of basics where it was like, well, as a kid, you started picking up on your dad's energy where you, you start learning that, well, maybe this is not the best time to talk to dad <laughs> or, or be around dad or hang around dad. You know what I mean? It started like that. Then as we got older and older and older, got as a teenager, went into adulthood, we've had this skill. We keep on honing this skill. We get so good with this skill that it becomes a superpower. But when it becomes a superpower, you know, when we have this superpower, there's a great responsibility of the superpower. And most of us, almost all empaths, uh, don't control the superpower. Okay, we have this superpower. We have this very unique superpower we've learned and we've honed in on, honed in on this skill as a kid, but we don't control it. So, you know, we're very sensitive to other people's energy. Okay, now our second superpower goes along with the first one. We have a very, very heightened intuition. Okay, you know, which that kind of goes along with our first superpower just because that's how we can sense people's energy. We have a very, very heightened intuition. We have a heightened intu intuition with us, but also we have a very, very heightened intuition with other people. Okay, and you know, both situations where this superpower gets out of control for us is because when we're, when we're around somebody, when we're at work, when we're around even groups of people, you know, we're absorbing everybody's energy around us. And that can be very exhausting. That, that's when we're not really in control of it. So we're not really here to talk about how to control this superpower. We're here to, we're here talking about, okay, I'm an empath. I have these two superpowers and I'm in this relationship or even in a past of oh, why does an empath flip and destroy great relationships? And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about hundred percent. I'm not talking about, there's a narcissist and there's an empath. Okay, a narcissist is on this extreme and an empath is on this extreme. I'm not talking about these types of relationships, but these types of relationships are, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've, I've you know, dated narcissists before, so for a long time. So I know these, you know, this is like a battlefield for an empath and a narcissist. So I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about a narcissist and an empath. I'm talking about you really feel you're in a great relationship and how do we destroy it? Okay, because we destroy it. It's our fault. Okay, it's, lots of times it's not the other person. It's our fault. And, and you're going to learn through this, and we're going. It, it's going to be a twofold. It's how we destroy a relationship, and really how not to, because because the, the, the things we're doing wrong, we can easily fix. And it's not really an easy fix because it's us really changing because we have such a bad habit doing this. And another thing you can do before we get started here, you can also read the book. No More Mr. Nice Guy by Danny Glover. I believe that's his name. Now, No More Mr. Nice Guy, it really goes into the nice guy syndrome. And he doesn't really talk about, in the book, he don't really talk about empaths. He don't really talk about, 
you know, the empath superpower. But I kind of reading his book and going along with his book and doing studies of his book and being in men's groups myself is usually the, the nice guy syndrome is very kind of close to an empath as far as our bad habits that we, we kind of, we kind of create with inside a relationship. So, so that's, you know, that's a great book, you know, to add to your personal development library that will help you out again, of course. Um, so pick up that book. But anyway, how do we do story relationships? And it really goes back to, you know, it really goes back to once we're in a relationship, what happens is to an empath is that we are, again, remember, we, we're really absorbing people's energy and we're really in tune to another person's energy. Okay. We always want to make people happy. We're always kind of, you know, sometimes if we're walking on glass around people, you know, you know what I mean, kind of the slang term, you have to walk around glass around this person. So that's no different when we enter a relationship. We're doing the same thing when we enter a relationship. You know, then as a kid, we've learned, we've learned to, you know, when we're around a parent or a very domineering parent is that we, we've learned to try to keep the peace. Okay. You know, we go with the flow. We, we have no boundaries. We set no boundaries. Even as a kid, a teenager in our early twenties, we've learned nothing about boundaries, setting boundaries, and even enforcing boundaries. And we've always basically kind of did what our parents wanted us to do or that domineering parent wanted us to do, because that's, we've learned that, that, well, if I, you know, if I do what dad wants me to do all the time, well, it keeps dad happy. Makes sense. So that's one, that's one bad habit of an empath. And we bring that bad habit into our relationship. And this is kind of the, the foundation of how we end up destroying a great relationship because we're bringing this bad habit into a relationship. We're bringing this superpower inside a relationship, but we don't know how to control the superpower. So let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about is when you're in a relationship you know, you're trying to keep the peace. Okay. You're trying to keep her happy. You're trying, I'm going to say her because, you know, of course that's, you know, I, I date women, you know, whatever your preference is, you can, you can rearrange it how you like, but you know, what we're doing is, is we're trying to keep her happy. Okay. At all costs. And what an empath would do, an empath is usually very, very passive, can be very timid. Um, they're, they're not the leader of the relationship. And that might not be what you want to hear, you know, especially as it, for a guy, usually an empath, almost 100%, you're the passive one in the relationship. You're not the leader of the, of the relationship. You, don't have, you pretty much have no frame in the relationship. There's usually an empath. Remember, an empath, isn't, he, he's not, they're not working in the middle. We're working to the extreme. So we're way over here. Same way with a narcissist. A narcissist is way over here. So like an empath is they're not going to have no frame frame in the relationship. They're not going to be the leader of the relationship. You know, their significant other is going to lead the relationship. I mean, same way when you had a domineering parent, that domineering parent, so that's what you're used to. They're domineering over you. So when you grow up, you're, you're kind of used to that. So you really have no frame in the relationship. You know, I, I hate to say this over and over and over to you um, because you might be disagreeing with me. Uh, so usually your significant other, is they're the one leading the relationship. They're the one that has frame in the relationship. They're the one that has boundaries in the relationship. They're the ones that were enforced the boundaries in the, in the relationship. It's not you. <laughs> and I hate to laugh. Um, it's not sometimes a laughing matter, but to keep it light of the situation. I mean, that's, that's just really the, the hard, honest truth. So let's, do, let's dig a little bit deeper. And you might know where I'm going with this. Okay. If an empath is it doesn't hold frame. They set no boundaries. Okay. And they don't enforce boundaries. Even if you tell me, well, Chad, I, I, I set boundaries, but I got to almost guarantee you, you don't enforce your boundary. When someone crosses that boundary, okay, cr does something you don't like, and it's a strong boundary for you. You don't say anything. You don't enforce it. Now, the way an empath will enforce a boundary is we do eventually enforce a boundary, but this is how we enforce a boundary is we feel like I'm just so much backed against the wall. You know, I have nowhere else to go. And finally, I'm forced, I'm forcing myself to enforce that boundary because I have nowhere to move. I mean, they back me against the wall. And, but the way I enforce that boundary is having a temper tantrum, <laughs> having a meltdown. I mean, screaming and arguing. That's usually an empath. 
you know, that's usually how an empath will start enforcing a boundary because they're just pushed against the wall. They've had enough and they have a meltdown. That's usually an empath. <laughs> so, so let's keep on continuing here. Okay. Since you, you, you don't, you're not holding frame, you're not setting boundaries. What ends up happening is as an empath, even, even in my life, what ends up happening is we tend, this is how, this is the number one key, how we destroy relationship is that we tend to resent our significant other. And this doesn't happen in a month. This doesn't happen in a few months. This doesn't happen during the honeymoon phase. You know what I mean? This happens when we've gone out for quite a while. We're over the honeymoon phase and we're, we're over that infatuation phase with each other. And what ends up happening is down the road, we start resenting our significant other. And the reason why we, we resent them Listen to this. The reason why we, we resent them and, we, and this resentment grows and grows and grows until we can't take it no more until until we end the relationship, until we break it off or we do something to end the relationship. Let's put it that way, too. Sometimes that happens as well. And the reason why this resentment grows is because, one, now this is also how we can fix it. One, we're not leading the, uh, leading the relationship. We, we have no frame in the relationship. OK, now with that, we set no boundaries in the relationship. So we tend to just go with the flow, you know, wherever, how they want to talk to us, they talk to us and we, we set no boundaries. And this is this human nature. OK, if you have if you're dating a great person or maybe you're, you're maybe you're married to a great person, you know, it's it's human nature for 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 somebody just to test your frame, to test your boundaries. You know, what I mean, and. They're not really doing it on purpose. Even kids do it. If you have kids, you know kids are always testing your frame. They're always testing your boundaries. So they're always testing you to see if you're going to say no or to see how much they can get away with before you say enough is enough. Um, you know, any relationship, a significant other is no different. They're going to test our frame. And, and once they keep on testing our frame and testing our boundaries and we don't do nothing and we don't do nothing, we don't do nothing. We just keep on letting it go, letting it go. We keep on... Um, um, we keep on letting them, maybe, maybe they start a little bit of talk down to us and we just let it go and let it go. What ends up happening is, is when we have our private time or we're alone, we tend to resent the person. We, we tend to, we tend to, you know, when we talk to ourselves, we tend to, um, in our mind, we're replaying this in our mind because we're not setting a boundary. We can't, we can't go to them and talk to them or communicate or say, Hey, I don't like this. We can't do that as an empath. Lots of times we fester on it. We fester on all these internal things going on and that, that festering kind of builds up. And let me, let me give you, let me give you an example. Um, I mean, it could be something as easy as where uh, I live in Thailand right now. I'm home visiting a family. So my girlfriend's in Thailand, but she's Thai. So she's, you know, she stays in my condo in Thailand while I'm here. But when we're together, you know, she doesn't work. I pay for everything. You know, I pay for the condo, pay for the food. When we go out, I pay for it. So she doesn't work. So, so, so when she doesn't work, when I'm there working, you now she's mainly, since she's not working, she's mainly the one doing the cooking. Um, one, she's making Thai food. So I don't know how to make Thai food. That's my excuse. <laughs> but anyway, if I'm working, I'm making the money, you know, I'm supporting her. She does all the cooking. She does most of the cleaning, which I do some cleaning as well because, you know, I like to keep things tidy and pick up after myself and stuff like that. But she'll do more of the dusting and do the dishes and she'll do all the laundry. Now, if I have to do the laundry, I just take the laundry to fluff and fold and have someone do it for me. <laughs> That's how Chad's going to do the laundry. But, but, uh, but anyway, she does the laundry. So, it could be something as simple as maybe her making a slight comment and saying, well, you never helped me clean. OK, then maybe I'll let it go. I don't say nothing. Then maybe, you know, maybe a few few weeks later, maybe she's cooking and she makes a comment. Well, I'm always doing the cooking and not doing anything. You know, what I mean, then I let it go and don't say anything. Then maybe a month later, she makes another slight comment. And then what she's doing is, is like she's not really doing on on purpose. Maybe she's venting or whatever. But if I don't say anything, I keep on just letting it go and let it, let it go, let it go, let it go. I end up festering on it. It ends up truly bothering me, but I don't tell her about it. You know what I mean? I don't say, Hey, you know, this bothers me, you know, stop making these comments to me. Okay. Um, 
meaning that I don't have that boundary. I'm not telling her, I'm not communicating because I, I, you know, I might secretly have a boundary, but I'm not enforcing the boundary. You know, and that's lots of times what an empath will do. And we, what we, what we tend to do, we tend to fester and fester and fester until we end up having a meltdown, like I explained earlier, or we just fester so much until we, we kind of, we kind of um, resent the person and we start not liking the person. And the reason we resent the person and not liking the person is because we, 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 we set no boundaries. Okay. And even if you say you set a boundary, you don't enforce it. Now, the second thing that goes along with this as an empath, and this is the nice guy syndrome too, usually as an empath, we, we kind of give up our friends, we kind of give up our hobbies, we kind of give up other the things that we like to do, our own personal interests, our own personal hobbies. We tend to kind of give that up to be in a relationship with our significant other. We tend to, and the reason why is because again, we're going, we're entering into their frame. Well, that's what an empath would do. An empath would enter in their frame because we're again with this superpower we have, we're feeling their energy, we're inside their energy, we're absorbing their energy, so we're always doing things that they like. Okay. And you know, lots of times their friends become my friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, we, like lots of times at an empath, like you won't, you, when you, you sit back and just think you, you, you're start noticing, like what I'm saying is true. You're start noticing, well, yeah, I haven't talked to my best friend or seen my best friend for a whole year. You know, I used to hang out with my buddies, but I haven't hanged out with them for like two years. Maybe you've text back and forth once in a while, but you haven't hung out with them. And the only person you hang out with, not counting you going to work and coming home, the only person you hang out with is your significant other. Okay. Then the only, the only friends you hang out with is your significant other's friends or the friends that you made through her. Okay. Or through them. You know what I mean? Um, and what ends up happening, you know, this is fine for a, a, a teeny tiny bit, but you're going to grow tired of it. Okay. You're going to grow old. You know, it's going to get old after a while. Depending upon how long it, how long, maybe it's six months down the road, a year down the road, maybe it's a couple of years down the road, eventually it's going to get old. So you're not going to be happy. Then at, we, we do the same thing. We start resenting the person. We start feeling like when I've been in long-term relationships, and for me, I've always been in long-term relationships. And when I've been in long-term relationships, you know, I fell in that trap where I'm not doing my hobbies. I'm doing my, my significant other's hobbies. Okay. Um, I barely, very rarely hang out with my friends. It might be once a year, twice a year. I hang out, my, hang out with my friends. Um, most of the time, maybe we text back and forth. Uh, if we hang out with friends, it's always friends that of they're either friends of my significant other, how I met them, or we met them together. So that's the only friends we I hang out with. I pretty much gave up my hobbies, and we we only do things together. And it's usually her hobbies, not not what I want to do. And so we start resenting them all, all over again. Then when we start kind of, we start kind of getting tired of this. So what we start doing is we start introducing, I start introducing my hobbies because I haven't did them for so long. Then all of a sudden, all the time we spend with our, my, our, my significant other, you know, then I try to get her to come over to do something I like to do for once. So maybe she forces herself, she comes over, but she, but she doesn't go with the flow like I do, you know, like an empath. Okay. You know, if she's really not into it, you know, she's like sulking or she looks sad all day. She's not really into it. She's saying, well, when can we go home? You know, I'm bored or I'm not really into this. So you can, as an empath, and maybe she's not going that extreme. Maybe she is, but maybe she's not going that extreme. But again, remember our superpower we have as an empath. So we're picking up her energy. So the whole time she's with me, you know, I'm picking up her energy and I can really feel she's not having a good time. So that, what does that do? That makes me not have a good time. Then I start, I, I don't tell her how it bothers me, but I, I'll start resenting her because I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I go with her. I do all her hobbies. All, I hang out with her friends. I don't complain. We hang out with them for hours. I do her hobbies for hours. I go to like, all weekend. We do what she wants to do for hours. And I never say nothing, never complain, always look happy. But when she, one time she comes over and, and does my hobby, I can totally pick up. She's, you know, she's really not into it at all. You know, she'd rather be home or rather be doing what she wants to do. 
And, and again, what we end up doing is we tend to resent the other person and we, we, and we resent the other person to a point where, where we end up ruining the relationship, breaking it off, breaking up, or we end up doing something, you know, maybe doing something we're not supposed to do. Uh, sometimes that, that happens as well. So really how we, we create like a remedy to this, and th this is tough. And for one, I would, I would, um, always advise to one, I mean, get the no more missing nice guy book, get it in your personal library, get books on, um, you know, holding frame, get book books on empaths. Uh, also if you're a guy join a men's group, you know, if you're a woman join a woman's group, um, because you know, hanging hanging around your you know hanging around with other dudes if you're a dude is is going to help you you know hold frame in relationship help you lead relationships better help you set boundaries and actually enforce boundaries and that's really kind of the remedy is um, to this is for one learning how to hold frame and it's you're going to be super uncomfortable when you do this but when you start becoming aware of it you start being aware that you, you're very passive and you're very timid in relationships and timid might not be the right word but you're very passive as you go with the flow you go with but you go but remember as an empath we go to the flow to the extreme so i'm not saying don't cast the argument well, well chad you know we need to go go with the flow sometimes <laughs> Remember, an empath works on, on extremes. We're all extreme on this side, okay? The narcissist is extreme on this side. So, so we're really extreme with what we do. So learning to hold frame. And the way we learn to hold frame is learning to set boundaries, okay? And part two to this is learning to actually enforce our boundaries. Because it's fine to say, Chad, I set boundaries. But once somebody crosses them, you don't enforce it. Or once somebody, once somebody says something that you really, really don't like, or it's something repeatedly they keep on saying or stabbing at you, but they're testing your frame, you know, you, you don't bring it up and you start festering on it. So start being aware with this. If you're festering on things, I don't like when she says this. I don't like when she says that. Why she say this to me? You know, you need to bring that to their attention. That that's, that's setting a boundary. You know, that's enforcing a boundary. You're bringing it to their attention. You're bringing it to their attention before it starts boiling up inside you and before you have a meltdown, because that, that's what you're doing. And, and, you know, at that point, you know, when you bring it to their, when, they, you, when you bring it up, you bring it to their attention, you know, then, you know, that conversation can unfold. Okay. Now it can unfold to the positive and it can unfold to the negative, but you know, that, that's basically how you enforce a boundary. A boundary is a boundary. You know, if, you know, if, if I have a boundary, and I, you know, I, I bring it to her attention and she really don't like it. She's really just coming at me. And then maybe the boundary, you know, now I keep on forcing a boundary. The boundary is, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should take a break for a little while. Or if she lives with you, maybe, well, maybe you need to go get your own place. You know, go back, you know, live with your mom, mom, dad, or go back to your sister. You know, I mean, that's really a boundary. You know, that's when you set a boundary, you're going to enforce it. And then when you bring it to their attention, you know, you, you know, depending upon how it pans out, but you're trying to bring it to attention because you know, your bad habit you have, you know, the bad habit is you're going to fester on it. And when you fester on it and you fester on it more than one day, you're festering for months, months and months and months, sometimes years on stuff. And we're just because you're festering, it ends up ruining it because you end up resenting the person when, when it's really your fault, it's really your issue just because you're not you're not setting boundaries and you're, you're not communicating it. You're not communi communicating what you don't like. Now, the second thing I want you to do is start doing what you want to do. Okay. It's okay to have friends. It's okay to have, if you're a guy, it's okay to have other dudes you hang out with. Go hang out with your friends. Go hang out with your dudes. Because remember, as an empath, we're super extreme. We're pretty much hanging out with nobody. <laughs> so, so start going out. Start going out with your friends. You know, sometimes if you know, start doing things by yourself a little bit. Maybe go to a movies by yourself. You know, if you if you had hobbies you've given up, you haven't done for years or you haven't done for a decade, but it's still a great interest of yours. Start doing your hobby and be okay with with doing your hobby by yourself. Be okay with it, or maybe you have a best bud that does a hobby with you. But but start introducing that back into your life, and I don't mean 
that you do it once a year, once six, once every six months. I mean, start really bringing it back in, into your life. And now when you start doing this, if she's used to, I'm going to say she, because, you know, that again, that, that's who I date. If, if she is not receptive to it, because it's, it's going to be a big change for her too, because especially if you've been super passive, you've always done what she wanted to do. You always do her hobbies. Her friends are your friends. She's not going to be used to it. So she's going to look at you as you're changing. And sometimes when you're changing for the better, sometimes that, that creates fear in the, in your significant other, because even though you're changing for the better, it creates fear. She wants to know what's going on. You know what I mean? So you have to be open and communicate what you're doing. And, and, you know, most of the time they'll be okay with it. I mean, sometimes they're not. So if they're not okay with it, again, that's a boundary. This is what I'm going to do, no matter if you like it or not. Okay. I've hung out with my friends for a long time. I want to start hanging out with my friends again. And I don't mean like, because again, an empath is super extreme. So, I mean, anything we do is going to feel extreme to us because we're not used to it, okay? Because we don't live life in the middle, okay? And, you know, I don't mean that we're hanging out with our best buds every single night. We're going out drinking every single night. But, you know, you doing it once a year <laughs> or once every couple of years, I mean, that's just not enough. So you got to start introducing your hobbies, introducing what you like to do. Go do things by yourself. Go to the movies by yourself. If you love to golf, go golfing by yourself. You know, start, uh, start joining men's groups, no matter, no matter if they're in person or online or you, you're doing it during, during, doing it over FaceTime. You know, start introducing that stuff in your life on a regular basis. Maybe you used to be a big, a big gamer. You know what I mean? Like me, me, with me, when I grew up, I used to be a big gamer and I don't play as many games now. Um, but lots of, but lots of times, if you're a big, big gamer, maybe go out, buy a PlayStation 5, buy a couple of your favorite games and, you know, have a game night. You know, I sit down and play games. You know what I mean? And, and if, you know, if she don't like it, so be it. It's a boundary. This is what I like to do. You have to, you have to be able to confront things when it is in your face. Okay. And this is, this is another kind of bad habit, habit between an empath and a slash Mr. Nice Guy, a nice guy syndrome is usually if somebody crosses a boundary or they say something we don't like, or they're, they're bickering at us all the time. Usually what happens, we don't confront it right away. We, we fester and fester and fester on it. Okay. What we got to get good at, we got, we got to, we got to start. We're not going to battle. We're not going to go to battle on every little thing, but once something is said, you know, a couple times, a few times, and it, you know, it keeps on reoccurring, then it's time to kind of say something and you have to be comfortable with that. And the more you get used to it, the, the more calmer you're going to be, the more nice you're going to be about it. And you're not going to be a dick about it. You know what I mean? In the beginning, you're going to feel like, honestly, you're going to feel like a dick, you know, because you're not used to doing it. You're going to feel mean and you might come off mean because you're trying to force yourself to do it because you know, you need to, you know, you set this boundary. Now, you know, you need to say something and you might come off mean because you're, you're trying, you know, you're not used to doing this stuff. Okay. You're not used to communicating and you, you might. You might be a good communicator, but in a different way. You know, you, you're a horrible communicator when it comes to stuff like this. You know, to communicate to communicate things you don't like, to com communicate things when you, when somebody crosses your boundary or talks down to you or talk to you where you don't with a certain tone. And if they're using a certain tone tone all the time with you, you know, then it's time to have a conversation and to talk to them about that. Um, then you know you go from there with that conversation. But, but you have to do it and you'll get better with it over time. And the way you get better with it is that you, you eventually be able to get to a point where, you know, when someone crosses my boundary, I can be calm. I can be collected. I can be nice about it and kind about it. And, but yeah, I'm still communicating my boundary. And if they don't like it, I'm still calm, you know, and I'm still saying, well, that's my boundary. You know, just like if I'm sitting here playing video games. And she don't like it. She comes in and says, well, you're always playing video games, which I might play video video games once a week. So it's not always. And she's having a little meltdown or she's making little comments. Then it's time, you know, then it's time to say, you know, to have a conversation, you know, never you know again. But my thing is, especially if you're in front of people, never confront somebody 
when you're in front of somebody else. You know, I mean, always show respect, even in business. You know, you pull people aside privately and have a conversation. Same way when you're sniffing at other. You know, if you're with your friends or whatever, you know, never do anything that embarrass, embarrasses your significant other. Never talk down to them or want to confront them and, you know, with with you know with your friends around and always show that initial respect because if you show that initial respect they're going to show that initial respect to you okay then if you then if they don't of course you know i'm going to bring that up like hey you know you know every time i talk to you privately it's always been in private manner matter and you know i've, I've always showed you respect i always pull you aside we talk privately about stuff so i'm not embarrassing you in front of in front of your friends so i would appreciate it you don't do it to mine and, you know, and that's a boundary, you know, and a boundary is a boundary. If she keeps on doing it, then, then we need to have another talk, you know, same way if I'm playing video games, I'm doing my hobby, what I like to do. That's what I like to do. Don't ridicule it. Don't put it down. This is what I like to do. This is what gets my brain away from work. So this is what I love to do. And I'm not doing it for hours and days, you know, let me be. Okay. Um, same way, same way that there have have their hobbies. But lots of times when we start trying to fix this, that, you know, we might get some, you know, clashing a little bit because again, you know, it begin, like I said, in the very beginning, you know, an empath, you're going to have a history of your passive. You're not leading the relationship. You have no frame. Your significant other is the leader. They have the frame. They have the boundaries. They set the boundaries. They enforce their boundaries. And they're used to you not. <laughs> okay, so when you start changing, when you start, you know, trying to get better and working on yourself, you know, there might be a little bit of clashing. Now, sometimes your significant other might like it. Okay, but there might be a little bit of clashing. And sometimes even when I when even when I read and I read No More Miss the Nice Guy, you know, several times, I actually went through a men's group with it. My best friend, my best friend and I went through the book together several times and, you know, talk about things. I mean, sometimes when you've been married for years and you start kind of almost like a recovering nice guy syndrome, I mean, sometimes, you know, th things end, you know, you're trying to improve yourself. You're trying to get better and your significant other, uh, just isn't going to have it at all. Um, sometimes that, that's a, that's really a narcissist, you know, you're in a narcissist an empath relationship. But, you know, when you talk about a great relationship, you're talking about a great person, a good person. Usually they're going to heal, hear you out. Usually, usually they're going to like that you're standing up for yourself a little bit. Usually they're going to like that you are, are hanging out with your friends more, doing your hobbies more, because they're going to see that you're more happy and they're going to see that, that you're more enjoyable to be around and, and they're go and they're going to see that you're trying to to communicate a little bit better, meaning things that you don't like, because you know, because again, you know that you you have a habit of festering. That when when you're festering for months and months and months and years on stuff, well, that creates bitterness, that creates resentment to the other person, and that's why lots of times, even though we're in a great relationship, we end up ruining it. But other than that, my friends, I mean, I know that I mean, I know this topic is a loaded topic. I know there's a lot of things we can we can talk about, a lot of examples we can talk about, um, and I will do more videos on this and really kind of dive deep into this, but just want to share my thoughts on that. But anyway, peace with you. I love you guys. And if you have a comment, comment below. Uh, let me know your thoughts on this. Let me know your, you know, your what you're doing to recover as an empath, what you're doing in relationships that you feel that's working for you. And, and it's stuff that's not working for you because it's also, you know, it's also a collaboration back and forth. I mean, we all can help each other, but other than that, peace out and I'll see you in the next video.